Coming up on this week's episode of TechSnap, we bust some cyber crime propaganda, cover a very common viewer question, and we give you the latest scoop on a very fresh open SSL vulnerability. All that and more on this week's episode of TechSnap. Hi everyone, and welcome to TechSnap. This is episode 54 of Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly systems network and administration podcast. We filmed this one live on April 19th, 2012. This episode is brought to you by GoDaddy.com, and I'll tell you more about them as the show goes on. And the live stream is powered by the incredible ScaleEngine.com. Calm. My name is Chris, and joining us, like every single week, is our host, the admin, the tech, and the teacher, Alan Jude. Hey there, Alan. Hey, Chris, everybody. Hey, man. Welcome back to TechSnap. Yep. We have a really great show. In fact, our top news story in the show this week broke just a matter of hours ago. In fact, uh, all of the major security distributions and vendors out there are still scrambling to respond to that, and we're going to tell you about that. Plus, we've got a, a war story coming up that uh, is from somebody new, but still takes place at IBM, interestingly enough. Boy, poor IBM. And not only that, we've got a terrific roundup with some CISPA updates that I want you to stay tuned for, because... CISPA is getting more and more relevant every single week. But, uh, Alan, is there anything you want to cover before we uh, roll right along? Nope. Good to go. All right. Well, I just want to give a, uh, a quick mention. Uh, we get a ton of great feedback here at the TechSnap show. TechSnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com. That's the email address. We've also been getting some voicemails, and we've never really set time aside to, to uh, respond to the voicemails. So uh, on the uh, most latest episode of The Faux Show, episode 86, uh, Angela and I uh, actually uh, played a few of them. We're going to do a, a mail sack segment in uh, The Faux Show from time to time, and that'll feature different, uh, different uh, feedback from different shows that we didn't get a chance to feature in those shows. So uh, we got a few in there from TechSnap, Alan. A lot of people really like the show, so... Uh, cool. Thank you, everybody, for writing in. You can check that out. Also, while you're over at jupiterbroadcasting.com, I'd like to remind you that you can support the continued production of these shows. You can sponsor Jupiter Broadcasting directly while you're getting yourself something. Go down to the very bottom of the Jupiter Broadcasting website and find our, our support Jupiter Broadcasting while shopping at links. And we have links down there for Amazon US, UK, New Egg, New Egg. <laughs> New Eag, I think it's something else. Think Geek, mm -hmm. Best Buy, Mint.com, and the incredible Audible.com, which has so many great books. If you click on those links before you buy, a portion of your entire shopping session will be contributed to Jupiter Broadcasting. Uh, we also have a Chrome extension down there, which will do it automatically for you, and the Firefox extension, which is in beta development. I put the uh, call out on last week's episode of TechSnap for testers on that, and we've got, we've got a handful of testers now, so... Uh, the Firefox extension will be out soon. I just want to be careful. I don't want to mess with anybody's browsers because I know how important right. web browsers become. So we're really making sure we test it. But uh, Rekai has uh, put together both of those extensions for us in the IRC chat room. And uh, I really appreciate that. Uh, one last mm -hmm. mention is uh, just to let everyone know, we stream these episodes of TechSnap live over jblive.tv at 1 p.m. Pacific on Thursday afternoons. And uh, you can join the live chat room and uh, holler at us. And uh, I think, see, there you go. Somebody's giving props to Rekai. Uh, but all right, Alan, enough with all of yep. that stuff. Why don't we jump into this top story? A major open SSL security issue has been found and, well, actually already fixed, but the details are pretty incredible. Tell me what's going on. Uh, so two researchers from uh, Google's security team basically found a flaw in uh, open SSL and then wrote a fix for it and contributed that back as well. Uh, and so if you're using any version of open SSL before today, so anything older uh, than 1.0.1a, 1.0.0i, or 0.9.8v. So then, what, uh, you mean what everybody's updated. running? Yes, every single version needs yeah. to be updated. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is pretty major. Yeah. Is it something that uh, is it something that we have any details on how severe it was or how it was found? Um. Yeah. So it's a vulnerability in the way OpenSSL handles DER encoded data, which is the one of the formats that certificates are stored in. It's the format that Windows uses and, and a bunch of other systems. Uh, most certificates uh, like that you would set up for your web server are usually PEM encoded instead, which is just a text format, uh, where DER is a binary format. Uh, but uh, So if a user has the ability to inject a DER certificate or anything into your OpenSSL, uh -huh. then they have the ability to 
cause a heap overflow and memory corruption and possibly an exploit. Aha. Uh-huh. So, uh, so that if leads they have to the access, dark side. Yeah. So if a user has access to OpenSSL, the command line, or if they can, you know, if, if a certificate they supply is being read by this a, a server like Apache or anything like that, then it can cause this to, to be triggered. Wow. Okay. Okay. So that's not too insignificant then. Yeah. Uh, so the Google researchers have a post up on the full disclosure mailing list that I linked to that provides all the details, including code samples and, and you know, more detail than anybody wants to know about OpenSSL. This, so these are the Chromium dudes, which is pretty neat. It's a nice... One of, them is, one of them is from the Google security team, and then the guy that wrote the fix is from the Chromium team. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Interesting. All right. That's pretty good. That's a nice contribution of Google, though. Yeah, regardless. <laughs> yeah. And they're so, working directly with the OpenSSL project, too. Yeah. And, you know, the Google security team does this with a number of projects yeah. when they find a problem. Yeah. They are definitely good about that. Yeah. Hmm. And uh, we'll see how some other companies aren't as good when we uh, get down later in the show. Uh-huh. Uh, what I found... So, oh, like, ahead. one thing we noticed is that Google is with the full disclosure, right? They gave all the information they had on the exploit and published it. Whereas, you know, when Microsoft sees something like this, they tend to keep it all secret. As far as we know, what, the, the one of the interesting things we were looking at before the show was uh, you can actually go over to the OpenSSL.org site where they have their development timeline posted, and you can actually yep. go through here and watch the series of events that these guys went through. I mean, we're talking this whole found the vulnerability and it's fixed all happened within what the last eight or nine hours? Is that yep. am I roughly right there? So it looks like uh, they committed the first fix to the their code repository around. 130 or so yeah. uh, UTC. Yeah, so, 136 uh, yeah, 136 in the UTC. Afternoon. Yeah. Uh, and then they merged it into the three different code branches and then updated the website and so on. Yeah. And then, an now, hour later. <laughs> yeah. And then a, a little later on they're working on cutting the new versions and getting all the releases out. This is the ultimate form of transparency right here. I mean, here you can actually watch them identify the issue. You can see even in the, uh, in the uh, timeline, they give thanks to uh, Tavis uh, and uh, the Google security team for discovering the issue right there in their change log notes. You yep. even see the change log for when they updated the public and sent out a security advisory. And then here's the actual check-ins to the final stable source code. As a, yep. as a you know, if you're an enterprise that's reliant on the OpenSSL technology, Knowing Which pretty much every SSL implementation is right, I mean, and being able. But if you're like you know, like if you're like a security vendor, like Checkpoint Systems or uh, any of those types of companies where you implement some of their technology in your own products, and you're going to have to cut your own fixes. Building your technology on top of something like this gives you visibility into the project, so you yep. know what you can tell your customers, and you know what your expectations are for your developers, and all those kinds of things. So it's incredibly critical that this Open SSL team does this, and they're. I think doing this, yep. I mean, exceedingly well. It sucks there's a vulnerability found, but but this is how you do it. Yep. And yeah, like you said, their their whole website is in their SVN tree. And so, or uh, I don't know which code repository to use. But anyway, so when they change their website, it actually shows up in the commit log. Yeah, that's great. That's absolutely great. And also their their official security advisor URL is literally just a text file. So now what the, now what the follow-up story might be in a couple of weeks is if, if people don't patch once they once uh once all the once all the different various patches get out there, if people don't update, then we're gonna have stories here on TechSnap where people took advantage of this vulnerability. So everybody yeah. go patch your S. I don't want to cover you and put you in the hall of shame. Yeah. I don't know exactly how exploitable this is. It's kind of specific and doesn't seem to be affecting uh SSL okay. so quite too much, although there are cases where you could trigger it via SSL. Okay. Uh but you know, if it was a vulnerability that every server running SSL could be exploited, that would that would be huge. Yeah, yeah. Uh, any other thoughts on that story? Uh, no, that's about it. Uh, the yeah. So this is a little breaking. I have a link into the to the CVE database, and mm-hmm. it's there's no details there yet. It's just a reserved number because things it's, are happening pretty fast right now. Yeah, I mean, it's funny actually. Uh, Alan, it's a lot of times we don't cover stuff that's that late breaking, but when it's a foundational technology like that and you got yeah. a lot of the details and they're transparent like this, you know, you can go ahead and you can talk about it because all the data is right there, which is, yep. which is great. Uh, all right. Well, why don't we talk about this next story? Because when I saw this come across my RSS feed this week, 
I honestly had a good chuckle because I never thought about this really from a foreign government's perspective. But this story that came across Slashdot, I am so thrilled that you put this in the lineup. Uh, mm-hmm. The U.S. is unhappy with Australians storing data on Australian shores. <laughs> That's just a great headline right there, which well, is obviously a little, a little provoking, you know? <laughs> yes. But uh, so basically, uh, some U.S. trade uh, representatives have taken issue with some statements by the Australian government, specifically the Department of Defense and the uh, Privacy Commissioner. Hmm. Uh, but basically, the Department of Defense uh, has been ma- making negative comments about various cloud based providers that are not based in Australia. So, you know, Amazon, Rackspace, and so on, uh, implying that hosting data overseas, including in the United States, by definition entails greater risk uh, uh, and un- of unduly exposing customer data to scrutinization by foreign governments. What he's saying is things like the Patriot Act and a lot of other things that are going on right now, CISPA, uh, mm-hmm. th- that it unduly exposes their customers to snooping by foreign right. governments. That foreign government is the United States government, and they're basically yes. saying that the the snooping and monitoring problem is such a legitimate issue that it has now become a blocker for business for them. I mean, that yeah. if that doesn't tell you that's a legitimate problem, I don't know well, what does. Specifically, where this came from was the Australian government was looking at using the cloud to, to do the like, government stuff. And then they were like, the privacy commissioner's like, well, there's a bunch of questions you need to ask first. Like, if you end your contract with a cloud provider, what happens to the data? Right. Because, right. like, with Amazon's cloud, there's no guarantee that your data is ever getting destroyed because of the amount of replication and so on that happens. It's entirely possible that there's copies of your data is still there even after you leave. Or you never know about backup tapes or whatever system they use. Exactly. If somebody came, uh, hello, Mr. Bezos, uh, we need to. Uh, get uh, the last five years of your backup tapes for a court case. I mean, what's Amazon going to do? They're going to turn those over. So, right. and, and well, not just that, but, you know, the U.S. government has the ability to say, and you can't tell the customer that we're seizing their data. Yeah, I love that one. Right? They can gag to, so that Amazon can't even tell the customer that their data is being seized by the U.S. government. Right. And so, you know, if the Australian government's going to store information about Australian citizens, then it kind of makes sense that they would want to do that in Australia. Where they would, you know, where Australian laws are applicable. Right. I mean, this completely makes sense. And it, it's also sort of a local economy thing. Yeah. Because uh, that's all that big iron and data well, infrastructure, yes. jobs. Like, I, understand, and, I understand that, you know, protectionism is, is frowned upon in a global economy. I guess. But, I guess. But I mean, uh, it, it seems to me that you'd almost want to do it for bandwidth issues. It's not like, it's not it, like. Yes, that's, that's the main thing is that, you know. <laughs> Cloud providers like Amazon, Rackspace, and Google don't have significant infrastructure in Australia. Right. And Australia has, you know, not that great internet out to other countries. And it's a business so, opportunity for local Australian businesses. So yeah. I, I just, I, I don't know what they expect. I guess they just, they're trying to look out for the best interest of U.S. companies. But if well, that's, that was that's the case... the job of the U.S. trade representatives, yes. Maybe, but, maybe what he could do is spend his energy uh, lobbying the U.S. government to get rid of things like the Patriot Act. <laughs> that might work. Yeah. Uh, so I have some links here, uh, including the list of, of uh, critiques the privacy commissioner had about cloud computing and privacy risks, and uh, some more details uh, from a couple different sources about what the U.S. was saying about it and, and what specifically they were taking issue with the uh, Australian government's right. stance on. The U.S. The U.S. representatives claimed that they were misrepresenting uh, U.S. policy, but um, the fact of the matter is, is it's it's enough of an issue. Well, where... it doesn't have to be a U.S. policy that they are going to snoop on Australian data. It's just the fact that there's no U.S. law that says the government can snoop on Australian data. Right, right. And in and, fact, and if it wasn't, it's like the data needs to be protected by an Australian law. And in, in fact, in 2001, and, there was an act passed that basically indemnified the telcos from sharing, if they shared any information with the government, they're indemni- indemnified from any legal action. That's already on the books. And there's very easily, you know, it's very easily to capture data in transit to the data centers and things like that. So they don't even need to own the data centers. They already own the telcos. Yep. So uh, interesting enough. Um, any other thoughts on that one before we jump on? Well, there's a couple, but, um, you know, with laws like HIPAA in the States to protect your health information or right. PEPIDA in Canada, the personal information uh, and what's it? Document Electronic Documents Act. That's it. Okay. Personal okay. Information Electronic Documents Act. All right. Uh, Is that the one where you get rid of the penny? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> what? 
That's just a big story down here in the United States that you guys got rid of your penny. Yeah. Uh, well, it's not got rid. We're just not making any more. <laughs> Don't uh, need any. Ooh, that makes me want one. That means they're exclusive. <laughs> There's only right. about a billion of them. <laughs> <laughs> now. All right, continuing on, sir. I'm sorry. I didn't uh, mean to derail So, you. you know, laws like that, that uh, stipulate what companies have to do to protect your personal information. And right, right. Privacy is like, I can see at some point some of those laws saying that for certain information, like electronic health records and so on, that they can't be exported to a foreign country. Right. Right. It almost, it, it kind of makes sense that, you know, if your insurance company is going to store your, your medical records, then that they have to do that in the same country as you are. Right. Right. And, and only could transfer with some sort of specific written consent or something. I don't know. Yeah. I, maybe we're old fogies, though. It just seems to me that, you know, you, in order to maintain control over your personal information... Yeah, well, that, I don't... Yeah, I agree. It's like a U.S. law to that like HIPAA protecting your personal uh, health information doesn't really apply if your insurance company can export your data to some country that doesn't have the same laws. The other issue is, is uh, that the quality of that data. I mean, this is a completely, I won't go off on the side rant, but the issue is, is that honestly I've gone into the doctor's office and they pulled up, they pulled up reports on me that said I was on medications that I wasn't on. Mm. And they said, so are you still taking? I'm like, what are you talking about? So and then when they share that data, they sh- it was with a completely different hospital. They share faulty data. So the mm. whole system has to be looked at. And I think the privacy matter is only one part of it, but it's a big part yep. of it. So, uh, all right. Were well, you ready to talk about the next story? Sure. So you know me. I've, I've, been, I've been beating this drum for a while where I think all of these reports of cyber attacks have been overhyped just to inflate... Uh, uh, defense right, budgets. like we saw these uh, reports of, you know, such and such a company has been attacked 20 million times. Well, and you remember the first one Need that really... A port scan. <laughs> the first one that really didn't pass the sniff test was that pump. Remember when they said that pump was attacked? And then yes. it turned out it was just a maintenance issue and the motor had ran dry or something like that and it wasn't a cyber attack at all. In fact, they, they mm-hmm. weren't even attached to the internet. Well, uh, no, this is an opinion piece in the New York Times, but I kind of felt validated by this one. Uh, cyber crime wave that wasn't, and I think they're making the case that it's a little over-trumped. Uh, what do you think, Alan? Uh, well, you know, they actually get into why the statistical methods that they use are wrong. Okay, great. Uh, but basically, like, we've seen this before, you know, uh, when we talk about the numbers from NASA, they included, you know... Porn one scans computer getting or... one piece of malware on it would count it as one, but if the same computer got infected with one malware, it's probably going to get five. Right. Like most, most malware that actually infects your machine is what's known as a dropper, where it gets on there just to install a bunch of other malware. Right, right. And, and if you what we also those separate instance, that's horrible. I think but what also, we also like, speculated was that perhaps even just like certain types of tracking cookies and things they might have been flagging. Right, like, you know, when you run your typical malware scanner, it picks up a bunch of cookies and like your Windows settings and a bunch of things that aren't right. necessarily malware. Right. And if you count every single one of those ever, then yes, in a company with a lot of computers, you're going to see some insane numbers. So are these guys making that case? Uh, that, not so much. In their case, they're looking at the reports of the amount of money that's been lost to cybercrime. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And okay. there's various estimates, but it's... Uh, some of them go as high as saying that a trillion dollars was lost. Trillion dollars? <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. I don't and know what's worse, this uh, cyber crime or uh, music piracy. Our poor economy, how can it hold up? Yeah. Uh, so they're saying the, the problem is the way that they, use, they apply the statistics to actually come up with these numbers. So most cyber crime uh, estimates are based on a survey, right? You ask 2,000 people or 2,000 companies how much money they lost to cyber crime. Right. And then, uh, then you extrapolate that for the number of companies in the U.S. or the number of people or whatever, or the number of people on the Internet. Uh, the problem is that that polling method, which you normally see with like political polling, where you ask, you know, are you in favor of this or not? Or do you like this candidate or that candidate? Or do you yeah, have confidence yeah. in the president? But with a, with a yes or no type question, then they kind of balance out and it actually turn out to be quite accurate. By surveying 2,000 people and extrapolating, you can get an accurate number. Uh, the problem is with when you ask these people to say how much money you lost, they're going to tend to exaggerate. Yeah, yeah. Or or how many hours did you spend uh, defending from cybercrime? Yeah. Well, our IT department spent 120 hours last month. Yeah. Uh Or how much money did you spend on firewalls and so on? Right. And all this, and then 
you know, because there's no negative values, no one ever says that they made money off of it. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, it means that when you extrapolate, just a couple of outliers in the data can totally throw the number off. Right. So, for example, in a 2006 survey uh, done by the Federal Trade Commission, uh, they surveyed a bunch of companies. And basically, there were two companies that reported very large amounts of money. And when they extrapolated that number for all the people in the survey and extrapolated that to the, to the number of businesses, uh, that would mean that those two companies would have caused the number to be $37 billion. Uh, and that's more than all the other companies in the survey put together lost. Right. And so, so those two outliers, because basically what you're doing is you would end up taking an average and expanding that for the number of people. So and the that thing doesn't is, work. Is the, the people doing this have to understand that that's how the math works, don't they? Right. I mean, you don't. Well, right? they're just they're just they're applying the wrong statistical model on purpose. Probably, if you're writing a report, you want to say not that much money was lost to cybercrime, or a lot of money was lost to cybercrime well, by and, a white paper. And keep in mind, I mean, we have clips, we have links that show that a lot of the data that's being kicked around in the Senate is is uh provided by Symantec and mm -hmm. Symantec is in the it's it is it, it is in their best business interest for this to be a big problem yep. and so they have the people that benefit the most from it supplying them with the data that they're going to base legislation off of although Symantec actually has maybe more statistically accurate data because they actually have scan results from machines i'm sure that's the argument they make and and i right. I, I can't argue that they and i for all i know they're being completely honest it just seems like a bad practice to have somebody's yes. who gets a conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. So it definitely is. Hmm. Well, that's, that's an interesting opinion piece. We have a link to the full article in the show notes. Any other thoughts on that? Uh, a couple things, but also like the, the numbers are based on a couple other assumptions, like the assumption that the cybercrime is only ever going to go up uh, or that there's an inexhaustible pool of gullible and unprotected users. No, you get everybody on an iPad. They're not going to be able to install apps. Then uh, everybody's just going to be kind of just walking around with these closed uh, ecosystems. <laughs> right. But uh, I think uh, the, the quote they used was overfishing, with, but with the pH. It's like, uh -huh. right. So if, if you find someone that's susceptible to phishing, right, they're going to believe this fake email is from their bank. If you, send them a, if you keep sending those to them, eventually they're either going to learn or run out of money for you to steal. Right. If you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna catch all the fish. Yes. And, you know, if, if cybercrime is so lucrative, more and more people are going to do it until each person can, can't make enough money to make it sustainable. Do you buy it? I'd, I'd say that, you know, the cybercrime is, is less of an issue than is being reported. Oh, I absolutely you know, agree with you there. It's, a, it's still a real issue and it's serious and things need to be done about it. Yeah. But a lot, most of these numbers we see bandied about are just insane and have no bearing on reality at all. Right. Right. I completely agree. Um, uh, and I'm glad to see somewhere in sort of a well-respected publication um, talking about it. Yeah, the people that wrote this op-ed were from the Microsoft security team. That actually makes me even happier mm -hmm. uh, because Microsoft... Uh, of course, Microsoft has an interest in downplaying cybersecurity as an issue. Do you think so? Because they can also sell solutions around it now. That's kind of been their approach. Yeah, but is... their, their, their main goal here is to say that Windows isn't as insecure as it used to be. Right. And they also probably don't want uh, uh, overall confidence in computing to be undermined because that would cost right. them money. So, yeah. uh, But at the same time, you know, I think the Microsoft sponsors real research at real universities, and I think that's where this type of stuff comes from. Right. Oh, you mean they're actually reporting like, actual real data and things like, like that. Microsoft research is, is not that much of a shill. It, they usually right. do real right. research. Yeah, absolutely. No, they're well-respected. Um, so uh, something else that's well-respected is not having to worry about all of this stuff and hosting and getting your domain from GoDaddy.com. That's today's mm -hmm. sponsor of the TechSnap program. And we have a couple of spring offers for you. And I want to tell you about this one because it lets you get a .com for $5.99. So say you are going to buy TechSnap is better. Let's see. TechSnap is better than IHOP. Alan, do you guys have IHOP in Canada? 
I think there might be a few mostly yeah, made to book. International there. House of Pancakes. Now, I understand everybody loves pancakes, but TechSnap is better than IHOP. So let's say you wanted to get that, but you don't want to pay a lot of money because it's kind of goofy. If you use the code 599COM7, 599COM7, you will get that .com for $5.99. You can actually get up to five of them, each of them costing $5.99. That's a That's great a deal. deal. It I, is a great I, deal. I need to think of some more names to buy. <laughs> obviously, GoDaddy's taking a hit on that because that's more than it costs them to buy the .com, which which is great. They're, they're just, that's what's great about GoDaddy is they often do that where they can pass the savings on. They also have a spring hosting or cleaning or renewing, whatever you need to do code. Use the TechSnap code SPRING7 when you check out and you'll save 15% on your order. Alan, look what I did. For everything, I, I think, including renewals. Everything. I went out and bought a .me domain. There you go. I got, I got filterfree.me. It's the official blog to the Unfilter show that we're working on at Jupiter Broadcasting. And look what the top story is here. Hillary Clinton, the world will divide into open and closed societies. Uh, one of the stories that's sort of a tangentially related story in the roundup later today is about comments that Hillary Clinton made that Boing Boing is interpreting about CISPA and things like that. I've got the clips of what she said and basically kind of proving that Boing Boing was being a little sensational with their post. But that's, that's going to be a companion. And I thought, I wanted to do something that would go with the show, and that's a great example if you have another project out there you're working on, something that can be related to that, or sort of supplements something you're already doing, take advantage of one of these codes to put up a site about it. I use the code SPRING7, and I save mm -hmm. 15% on my .me. And thank you to GoDaddy for sponsoring this week's episode of TechSnap. Yes. Uh, all right, Alan. Well, I think we got all the news done. Let's jump in to the TechSnap feedback. Thanks for sending your emails to techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com. In this week's feedback segment, we've got a question and we've also got a war story. But Al and I, we're going to cover the story, uh, the question first, because uh, I bet this is one that actually a lot of TechSnap viewers have. Because, uh, well, it's it's pretty common for anybody that wants to do a little hosting at home or or start small and then has to grow. So, uh, yep. all right. Well, here, I'll, I'll, are you ready, sir? I'll fire off the first story or first okay. question. All right. So Simon wrote in and he says, hi, Chris and Alan. I have a question for you. Would you mind explaining the best approach to moving services from one Linux machines to several machines? And he's only got one IP address to do it. So say he started small. He had MySQL, Apache, and maybe a couple other services running on one box, right? Mm -hmm. Now, to sort of give more horsepower to each one, he wants to put SQL on one box, and he wants to put Apache and maybe DNS on another box. But all of them are sitting behind a single IP address. Uh, whereas before, that didn't matter because it was only pointing to one server. But uh, now he wants to know what should his approach be to uh, send the appropriate traffic to the correct machines and all the technicalities that might lie in there. What do you think, yeah. Alan? There's a, a couple different ways to do it. Uh, one of them is obviously using NAT. Uh, now, there might be a couple approaches here. It depends what type of connection he has. There may already be some kind of NAT setup. But uh, if you did, uh, in his setup, he's got the existing server which is going to be his DNS server and basically the router, for a better word, uh, to the two new servers that will, one will host the email and one will host the websites, which is MySQL and Apache. Uh, so he can use NAT to do that since they're each on a separate port or whatever, and he can route the different ports to the different internal IP addresses. Right, okay. And, you know, IP tables or whatever can handle that. If it's FreeBSD, there's IPFW has built-in NAT, or you can use NATD, the user... Uh, mode one, or there's also uh, IP filter or PF, which each have their own NAT solution. Or we could do a PF sense box. Yeah. Uh, but that would take a fourth box. That'd be another box. Forward. I know. Yeah. I know. Anyway, uh, with the so that works, and also you know if you have three machines and you need to share the IP address, you're going to need NAT anyway. Otherwise. The Apache machine is not going to be able to connect it up to the internet. So if anybody has a PHP script that reads an RSS feed <laughs> yeah, or right, right. the mail server that he has behind there is going to need to connect out to deliver mail. And so you're going to need NAT at some point anyway. And so just doing the port forwarding there is the easiest solution. It also has the advantage, uh, unlike doing a reverse proxy or some kind of port forwarding, uh, like with an actual daemon, is that the IP address that Apache will see if you're using that, is the real source IP address of mm -hmm. the user. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, your other option is use something like Balance or HA Proxy or Pound or one of the other, you know, web server proxy type things or TCP load balancers. 
is that when you use that, where they accept a connection and then make a new connection on your LAN interface, the IP address your uh, Apache server sees will be the internal IP from server A right. rather than the client. So it'll IP. be like a 192, 168 or something like yes. that. That doesn't is not very good for stat so, tracking and things yeah, like that. Yeah, when all of your traffic looks like it comes from one IP address, it's <laughs> yeah. hard to break it down. <laughs> uh, yeah. Now, some of the apps, like I think HAProxy, I'm not sure, or you know, if you used Nginx in that same setup, mm -hmm, they mm -hmm. have support for something like uh, X forwarded for or X real IP. So there's a module for Apache called mod RPAF. You install that, and it, uh, if the connection is from a certain list of IP addresses, which would be your internal LAN, then if it sees a header like X real IP, it will Apache will use that IP address rather than the physical IP address to on the request. Ah. So all of a sudden, now in your Apache logs, it has the right IP address again. Right. And so the advantage of using something like Nginx is that it can do uh, HTTP and HTTPS. It can handle some other stuff. It uh, provides a bit of protection in front of Apache as well. Uh, but the other option, uh, including uh, keeping that real IP address, is that if you have multiple Apache servers, Nginx can make decisions there. Right? If you use uh, NAT or if you're using... Uh, something like balance or HA proxy to, to forward to your, your Apache server in your LAN, they can't make decisions, that, right? They only have like TCP IP level access, right? Layer three or four. Mm -hmm. They can't make decisions based on the URL or something. Right. Whereas because Nginx is layer seven, it can. So you can create... Ah, some rules so, and whatnot. Yeah. So when, when someone connects to the, to the website yeah. and goes to like slash server one, you can route that to one Apache right. and slash server two can go to a different Apache. That's handy. Or you can do it based on HTTP virtual hosts. Uh, Varnish can be can set the X real IP as well. Alan is responding to the chat room. <laughs> yes. For those watching. Uh, somebody, I was talking to somebody in the chat room earlier about <laughs> Varnish, Nginx, and Apache. And basically, almost anything can set the header. It's just you have to respect the header in Apache. So in Apache, you would need something like mod RPAF and on its allow list for a mod RPAF, you would have the IP of the Varnish server. And then in Varnish, you just say, add a header called X real IP and put the client's IP address in. I think the only issue there, though, is that sounds like a lot of extra software configuration. Sounds like he wanted to go pretty straight, Apache, DNS, MySQL, and then Right, so if you, if you don't need Nginx to do the any kind of fancy routing of like HTTP level routing, uh, then yeah, the NAT is the easiest solution. You're going to need it anyway. And it allows you to do one-to-one -one port forwarding and say, this port goes to this machine, this port goes to that machine. And it looks like he was actually at the bottom of his uh, question. He mentions that he was, exp he was saying, I know IP tables can do this type of port forwarding within a single machine. Right. So uh, what he was talking about there is in the pre-routing table and IP tables, you can say, when a packet comes in with this, rewrite it to that. Right. So you, can, you could change the port number that way. Right. Yeah. Uh, right. So that if you had two different MySQLs running, you could do different things, mm -hmm. uh, but that doesn't really help. All right. I, I would say if you had the extra box, uh, just go easy, just make life easy on yourself and go PFSense because it's such a great yep. software stack. And if you can well, put it in front can, of those machines... He can put it on the box A. If it's only going to be a DNS server, he can set the oh, DNS absolutely. server up in PFSense. Yes, that's totally the way to go. That's totally the way to go. Yeah. And, I, and the reason I like this question a lot is because he's going with physical boxes, but this question could just as easily apply to somebody who decides they want to break off different pieces into virtual machines. Yes, and like so this, actually, uh, that's not exactly, but that's kind of what I do. Uh, with my machines, when I set them up, I have the base OS, and then I create jails, which are okay, kind yeah. of virtual, but not. Right. And then I'll have Apache in one jail, and MySQL in a different jail, and so on and so on. Like our video server runs in its own jail, and then each of those has an internal IP address, and then I do some routing. Jails are fantastic. I mean, that's, yeah. a, that's just a, that's an undisputed... And, you know, I, I cheat feature. a little bit. Sometimes my jails have public IPs. Uh, but mm -hmm. some of them only have internal IPs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like the, the uh, fast CGIs we use for on Scale Engine for the, executing the PHP code for jupyterbroadcasting.com. Each of those is, uh, there's like 10 of them, each on a different physical box in a jail, and they all use NAT to connect out using the same IP. Wow, okay. Because yeah. <laughs> we, well, basically we didn't want to waste 10 IP addresses on right. boxes that, that never need that. an incoming connection. Yeah, they, yeah. Outgoing connection. yeah absolutely. 
Uh, that's yeah. interesting, though. So there you go. There's some practical ways to apply that stuff, uh, Simon. Hopefully, yep. I- and then uh, related to his uh, IP tables thing in FreeBSD, the firewall uh, IPFW has a forward command where you can actually say, when this packet comes in, just send it out this other interface. Uh, but it doesn't rewrite the packet at all, so the machine that's receiving it has to know what to do with it. Otherwise, it will bounce it back, and you just end up bouncing it back and forth until the TTL runs out. Right, right. Uh, uh, also, uh, Simon is from Australia, so I wonder if yep. you might have any opinions on our uh, Australian data stories, data center stories earlier. Uh, all right, sir, are you ready to move on to uh, Mike's war story? Sure. All right, now, is there any spot in this, or am I just color commentary again? Uh, I- yeah, I, I got it. Um, okay, all right, here we go. The, the interesting thing with this one is that just because this happened at IBM, doesn't, it, it, this story could happen at any company anywhere. Well, a lot of all of these could for the yeah. most part. Yeah. Uh, well, that's why these IBM stories are so funny because, you know, if, if you work in an office, you can be like, yeah, that, that happened here too. IBM's the perfect one because they're sort of well known for corporate bureaucracy. So that's always, that always leads to these IT stories. Yes. Plus but they're I, huge, I, right? So they've got all well, kinds of scenarios. <laughs> what I call big company syndrome. Very big. They are the def- I think they defined big company syndrome yeah. back in the day. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. What happened? Uh, so Mike's sending in his war story. He says, after hearing so many war stories from the other, other Alan, he decided to add his own IBM war story. Ah, nice. So he'd been a, a contract employee at IBM since uh, 1997. And in around uh, early 2000, him and four other guys were assigned to a new network operations outsourcing center. So this is where companies could outsource their network operations center to IBM. Because, you know, to have a proper network operations center, you need a couple of people 24-7 to respond to problems. And I guess this was like before like Pier 1 and Server Beach companies were really huge. Yeah. Right, because and, this well, is... it's more like this was for companies that had their own gear in their own offices, right? But needed somebody to monitor it, and they didn't. Well, why pay our own stuff, people to be? And on you know what else? This, is, this was also, I, in fact, I remember now because a bank I worked at, they also hosted a lot of like their System three hundred and ninety, like IBM specific mainframe type systems there, where you could yep. you could use that too. So that was another thing yep. for that. Okay, all right. But basically, the idea was pay IBM, and they will monitor your servers for you. Yeah. And they have people on staff 24-7 where, you know, you can get, basically, you outsource it to IBM and it's a lot cheaper than, you know, you, you and a bunch of other companies share a team of people instead of each of you trying to have your own person 24-7. So the bank I worked at, the, uh, the System 390, when its hard drive failed, there was a representative from IBM at the front door before the people from the data center even arrived that morning to fix it. And it was just one of the redundant drives. It didn't even matter. Yep. But they were literally on top of it. And they had a little, they had a little 386 computer that they had a modem attached to that ran OS2 that they would dial into to do remote diagnostics on the mainframe. <laughs> Craziness, eh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so the basic idea was that the four of them would perform network operations for customers and like small and medium businesses that are not part of IBM. So uh, their very first customer was a textile company that had facilities scattered all over the United States, from Georgia to California. And basically, the IBM salespeople went in there and sold the company a package of software, hardware, and services that included the uh, IBM uh, Tivoli and NetView monitoring systems oh, for yeah. all their servers, oh, boy. all their hardware. You ever, you ever, you ever looked at Tivoli? Yeah. Oh, boy. It's, it's, a, it's a big product made from a big company. Yeah. Uh, but basically, that would do all the monitoring and, and maintenance on their network. Uh, so as was always the case, uh, you know, IBM had specialists that would go out in the field and perform the installs and do the configuration for the customer, uh, and then they would be responsible for maintaining it. Uh, so the initial install took about a week uh, with a couple of days for training everybody and so on. And then, uh, you know, you get all this oohs and ahs as the at the customer, they installed three huge IBM Netfinity 5500 uh, quad processor Pentium 3s. Oh, running server. the power. <laughs> well, yeah, in 2000, that was, you know, four yeah. processors was a big thing. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. I'm sure they had nice big per- fans on those things, too. Remember how loud those old servers were? I mean, servers are still very loud, but those... Yeah, mine's still so very loud. Yeah, <laughs> very true. Uh, uh, so anyway, they got this, you know, quad processor Pentium 3 running Windows NT server, and uh, the technicians were explaining all the bells and whistles, including event correlation and intelligent discovery of, of network devices and so on. Hmm. About two days after they left, the database crashed. <gasps> Uh-oh. 
because you know if if a hard drive is going to fail, it's usually within the first couple of days or after a lot of years, like five years, yeah, yeah. Uh, so two days after that, the database crash, uh, and you know you can't have that be down with no monitoring. So the the customer stuff is still up. It's just the monitoring system that's crashed. Oh, that's horrible. Uh, and they they can't leave that while they wait for it to get fixed. I look at it, so, oh man. So that's where you know patchwork comes in, right? Right. Uh, so you can't have no method of monitoring the customer systems. Uh, so they took an old copy of What's Up Gold, which is an old server monitoring program. Oh, yeah. I used to use so that back in the I day. I remember when I worked at the power plant, they had that with different Simpson quote dot uh, WAV files that would play when each different server went down. What's Up Gold 95. I had that one. I had What's Up Gold Pro. I mean, yeah, What's uh, Up Gold is... Uh, yeah. And so they installed it on the only spare hardware they had, which was an old ThinkPad 765 laptop. Oh, boy. Uh, so as IBM repeatedly sent out technicians to fix one thing or another with that Tivoli environment or an Oracle database or whatever else was broken, right? Uh, they chunged along for an entire year <gasps> monitoring 40-odd no. NT servers uh, and a whole bunch of network hardware from a little Pentium 1 166 megahertz laptop. That talk about not looking good. I mean, talk about bringing something in there, bringing a solution to your customer, and then... well, the customer may not have known that's what was happening, right? Oh, very good. You got point. all this gear, the things being monitored. It looks like I don't care how. Oh it's my like, gosh! You know, it, you know, I've if, worked at tech one, companies that have done that too, where it was well, like a, once, once you have something that's good enough. Right, it, it's the right. fire's out. I I know a company that paid quite a bit of money for a custom monitoring solution, and then I, it didn't work very well at all. And we ended up just going with uh, Nagios. I mean, it was like you know, it's funny that happens probably more often than people admit. Yes, you 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 start with this big goal with all these features, and it all breaks, and you're just like, we just need the bare minimum from that we can get from this other little software and get right. working. <laughs> so oh untold thousands of dollars worth of software and hardware set. Pretty much unused until it was disassembled, uh, disassembled at the end of the contract. Oh, jeez. Well, yeah. There you go. I, uh, I, a little mini war story. I once had a client who had a locked off room, and uh, it was in a detached building that uh, wasn't a part of the main campus. And uh, they asked me to go over there and look over some old equipment they had. And I said, well, there's this locked room. I can hear humming coming from it, but I don't know what's in there. And they said, oh, well, uh, you know, the IT guy that worked here, that, but that was six years. I'd worked there for five years, and he had left a year before that, so that was six years ago. The IT guy uh, that uh, worked here before you had some of his gear in there. I said, really? And so I went in there after they uh, got their janitor to bust the door open because they didn't even have the key. And I found a bunch of 486s running uh, old, old versions of some sort of Unix. I don't even know which Unix it was. Hooked up to a T1 line and then had a bank of six or seven modems. So there was like six or seven phone lines. And this client had been paying for all of that the entire time and just thought it was part of their regular internet access. But he had been using it for his own private internet access back in the day and had used it to like call in and check on stuff and set up file shares, all running out of this client's office for years for years and then eventually got sold he just abandoned the gear but never told them so they kept paying for the equipment they've spent they spent and like the ten, T1 line and everything they spent like ten thousand dollars uh must have been it must have been more than that though total but yeah i mean we just couldn't believe it it was it was like wow so those kinds of yep. things happen man uh mm. all right well great war story and thanks to mike for sending that in alan but i do believe that means it's time for the tech snap roundup <laughs> Welcome to the Tech Snap Roundup. Yeah, that's what that crazy music means. The Tech Snap Roundup are stories that didn't quite make it into the main top of the show, but they're links that we think you might want to go check out. They're follow ups, they're just interesting stories, and they're almost always exclusively powered by our Tech Snap subreddit over at links.techsnap.tv. And thank you to everybody who voted over there. A couple of the stories in the Roundup are some of the top voted stories this week. Uh, Alan, are you, sir? Are you ready to jump into the Roundup? Yep. All right. Everybody get out your uh, SOPA SISPA soapbox, SOPA SISPA soapbox, because uh, SISPA has been updated, but according to techdirt.com, it still doesn't quite cut the mustard or the cheese. They, they titled it some progress, but still big problems. Uh, they have narrowed the definition of cybersecurity, which is a particular spot that we took issue with last week on the right, show. Right, because the very, very, very vague interpretation they had could mean that 
by encrypting something, you are hindering the government's ability to spy on you, and therefore you were a cyber terrorist. Right. So uh, uh, they, before also, efforts to degrade, disrupt, or destroy system networks such as, this was, remember this part, theft or mis misappropriation of private or government information, intellectual property, or personally identifiable information would be considered a cyber attack. Okay. And that's mm. pretty broad, right? Because, I mean, taking an MP3 file would technically fall under that definition. Right. So uh, I, don't, I don't really like that very much. Right, Anyways, and I they, understand what, when they're saying intellectual property, they mean, you know, stealing research from Boeing, but when they're not very specific about it, then, yeah. So here's what they've changed it to. It's still kind of broad, but here's what they've changed the wording to. Efforts to gain unauthorized access to a system or network, including efforts to gain such unauthorized access to steal or misappropriate private or government information. So it's a little more defined, but it still yep. includes private information. I, I don't like the overall term. Neither does TechDirt. Uh, they go on to say, while it's slightly improved, it doesn't really take care of the fundamental security and privacy issues. And it, it can still easily be considered a problematic bill. And this is, this is uh, from their article. Still considered a problematic bill, which doesn't properly safeguard personal privacy. One of the biggest problems is the fact that the government can use it to retain and affirmatively search the information they gather for vaguely defined national security purposes, and it's that part of it is untouched in this new draft. Um, and I mentioned it earlier during the GoDaddy ad, but uh, Hillary Clinton uh, two days ago was at an open government summit where she was actually up on stage saying that open governments and governments that promote open communities are going to be successful, and governments that try to hoard information and that close down are going to fail. And it's it, there's just some sort of deep sense of irony, I think, in that she's out there saying that, while at the same time, they're working on bills like PIPA, CISPA, SOPA. And there's even another one that's, like, that's almost identical to CISPA that's in the works. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's fundamental. It's just, it's just unbelievable. But uh, TechDirt has a great write-up on it. So a uh, link in the show notes for that. All right, Alan, are you ready to talk about the next story in the roundup? Yep. There's uh, a rumor carriers are capping LTE services. What's well, going on? Uh, yes, uh, one of the IEEE, uh, a veteran from the IEEE has said that it seems that the, the data transfer caps that uh, carriers are putting on LTE service have less to do with their, you know, lack of capacity, right? They need, you can only use so many gigabytes because uh, otherwise there won't be enough left for everybody else. Uh, and more that they don't want you to replace your home internet with just, you know, your uh, little Zoom see, stick or whatever. They that call seems funny to me because Verizon Wireless at least in my state, is selling a home internet service that uses LTE. In fact, my dad just got it. It's like this mm -hmm. little whole, it's this whole kit. He's got like a five gig cap. And if he pays like a little more, he gets like an 11 gig cap. And it's, right. it's, a, it's a router and it hooks up all his machines in his whole house. Right. But the, Verizon would rather that you had Fios and then one of those sticks for your laptop. Yeah. And well, and they do have him capped, right? And he has to pay yeah. more if he wants more than five gigs. And he yeah. mentions that with a couple of computers, just doing OS updates plus like app updates on his mobile device and on his iPad, mm -hmm. that puts him at his five gig cap almost every month. Oh, yeah. It's so like, uh, when, I, when I first, uh, when my ISP was first introducing caps, I found a, a problem with my IMAP setup where I was using, you know, a gigabyte a day in email. <laughs> I've got that down a little bit, but. That's, you know, and Metal Freak in the chat room points out, like, I take it your dad never watches any of your shows. These caps are a fundamental uh, issue for online uh, media. Yes, and actually we can skip to that story right now if you want, but there we have a story about that in the roundup. If you want to, sure, I don't mind. Let's do okay. it. Uh, which story uh, is it? So Netflix is complaining that Comcast ah, is yeah. basically uh, violating net neutrality. Uh, so specifically, if you watch a TV show via Comcast's Xfinity service, it doesn't count against your Comcast data cap right. of X hundred gigabytes. Right. right. Uh, but if you use Netflix or Hulu or anything like that, that does count against your right. data cap. Right. Now, you remember, uh, we covered this on the Linux Action Show a year or so ago, when Google sat down with uh, the FCC or whoever it was, I believe it was the FCC, and they said, all right, let's pass a deal. Here's the rules for wired networks. But you, but but uh, and and you know we won't we won't uh, do tiered services and we won't do these sort of different packages where some things are unmetered and some things aren't as long as you let us control the hell out of wireless spectrum. But 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 
But these private networks that aren't public internet networks, those can still be excluded from all of the rules. And so what Comcast is saying is, well, yes, we deliver the Xfinity on-demand programming over the copper wire. It runs on a completely private IP space. So therefore, it is not the public internet and it is not beholden well, to the rules set by the FCC. Well, there's uh, a caveat to that. It's like, specifically, if you're a Comcast and you're delivering that Xfinity service from your data center, you're not paying any money, right? It doesn't cost Comcast anything to deliver bandwidth inside their own network. Whereas when you're using Netflix, they have to buy bandwidth from level three or whatever. And, and that's their argument. That's why yeah. Comcast says that's why Xfinity doesn't apply to your charge. Now, the fact yeah. that Xfinity is now a, a video movie streaming service that competes with Netflix, well, that just is a coincidence. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah. So while there, you know, there's a valid uh, friend to to Comcast where yes, this service actually doesn't cost them as much money, and it, you know, that that's how they can uh, not include it in the data cap. But at the same time, that's that's giving them an unfair advantage because they're they're basically the ISPs are supposed to be neutral. They're just delivering bits. They're not supposed to be selling services like this. Right. Don't make and it now that it's a dumb pipe that that has bits on it. Yes. Uh, do you remember the Netflix blog post they did where they explained that a lot of times these ISPs are exaggerating how much bandwidth Comcast takes because, like in the case or of Netflix. Comcast, or, yeah, in the case of Comcast, they bring in a connection right to like distribution points in the Comcast network. Yep, and it's not like right Comcast here. is pull, it's like, it's not like Comcast from somebody in New York is pulling the data all the way from some server in California. You know I'm, what I'm saying? They have CDNs locally where they where they provide right to the major networks. So yep. in a lot of cases, Comcast actually is almost directly streaming it through their internal network. It's it's actually yes. the only way to make Netflix as reliable as it is. Exactly. Uh, so I hope Netflix continues to fight the good fight. Of yeah. course, Comcast also being an ISP is also the major stakeholder in NBC, yes. uh, a major it's television now, player. You know, so uh, NBC Universal Comcast. Yeah. And you know those. None of those three things should be allowed to be together. Yes, the right. ISP should be completely separate from media companies, and that's the only way the internet can succeed. But, you know, most people don't have a choice of anything other than Comcast for their internet. Right. And, you know, why would they pay for Netflix when it uses up their internet usage? You do have to, yeah. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's, it, but, you know, this is, uh, I think we talked about it a little bit before, but some of the other CDNs, specifically ones like Akamai, the reason why Akamai is so successful is because what they managed to do, especially since they've been around since the 90s, was they would talk to ISPs like Comcast or even my local Shaw. Right. And they said, let us put a box in your local head end, right? The, each like local node that talks to your customers. Mm -hmm. And we'll serve things like Microsoft Windows Update, uh, the FBI's website, because we were just talking about that in the chat room, or you know, streaming media, all this stuff, from a server inside your own network. So it doesn't use up your ISP's internet connection. It's just using up your internal network. Right. And so basically, Akamai gets to charge their customers for delivering this content, but the ISPs don't have to use their internet, so they're not paying. And Akamai doesn't have to pay the ISP for local hosting. Yeah, it's a win-win. Yeah, um, so the ISP wins and Akamai wins, and the content provider pays. While we're in the ISP subject, let's jump to the next story in the roundup because uh, it kind of fits in with this. I want you to meet Nick Merle. He is, uh, I believe he's in California, and he wants to create the first completely private, non-tappable ISP. And I don't fully understand and grok how this, so this is definitely a follow-up for your own reading story here. But uh, this guy, he's uh, previously ran a New York internet-based provider, so he's got, some, uh, he's got some experience and some funds in the area, in this field. But he's putting together a network that he wants to be technically impossible. Uh, he'll use all legal and technical means to resist having to hand over information and aspire to be the partner in telecommunications industry that the ACLU and EFF have always needed but never had. I don't know much about it. Right now, it kind of sounds like, uh, like he might do possibly a combination of WiMAX and other wired options. So that way he can set up his own independent services in some area that won't be dependent on riding on top of other telcos, but that won't work in all areas. Right. And well, but, but basically the idea that here is that by not giving in to the government, letting them install monitoring hardware at his, at his data center and, you know, not 
doing what he can to not give over people's private information. So possibly not asking the customer what their name is. You yeah. can't give away the customer's name if you don't know it. Yeah, that's true. You, yeah, there's, uh, you're not lying if you don't know it, Alan. Uh, yeah. All right, well, let's talk about Oracle. They accidentally released a MySQL denial of service proof of concept code uh, in their in their latest uh, push of code, right. the MySQL version 5.522 and yeah. 5.162. Uh, I guess it was a... So basically, there was a, a security vulnerability that would allow someone, when they targeted a MySQL server, it would actually like quit. Like it would uh, crash, crash it. and be off. Right. Uh, which, you know, if, if you target a web host like DreamHost or something, that would take all the WordPress blogs down. Um, and so they released a new version and in their source code under the testing directory, there's a test to make sure that the fix worked, right? They have automated testing, right? Before every time they go to release a new version, they run every test for every bug they've ever had and make sure that bug's still fixed. This prevents what's called a regression where some change unfixes a bug or reintroduces a bug. Right. Uh, but basically, so under their test directory, they have a test to make sure that MySQL won't crash. Uh, from this denial of service attack. <laughs> so that means if you download the newest version and grab that script and point it at an older server, it will crash it. There it is! <laughs> uh, so specifically, Oracle took the opposite stance of Google, and rather than releasing all the details about this uh, flaw in MySQL, they've kept everything as secret as possible. So now, uh, people running MySQL don't know what the problem is exactly. <laughs> but anybody following the MySQL source code right. could probably figure it out. And now, they, now they have a tool. So, you know, this automated testing is important, but if you're not going to announce the security vulnerability, you can't accidentally publish the, the uh, testing tools for it. Hey, uh, remember, remember how cool it was before Oracle owned MySQL? Yes. That was cool. Uh, should we talk about the next story in the roundup? All right, this one's pretty interesting because it's a mechanical CPU clock. And of course, you know Alan dug this one up. This, mm -hmm. this is probably right up your alley. Uh, this guy actually built so, uh, like a mechanical machine to kind of learn how CPUs work and show people, right? Yeah, so this implements all the basic building blocks of what a CPU is, like an ALU and the clock and so on. And, but in a larger scale with mechanical so that you can actually see what's happening. Uh, I kind of got interested in this a little bit by watching people building... Uh, CPUs and memory systems and, and, and different components of a computer sure. in Minecraft. Yeah, oh yeah. I saw that and, too. Yeah, and it's like, so, you know, you've always wanted to know a little bit more about how a CPU works. Like, I understand the basics, but, you know, you get more information by digging into it a bit. Mm -hmm. Very and cool. And they've got a cool. video up on their site of it, of it working in progress and stuff like that. That's, that's pretty neat. Yep. All right, well, uh, we'll keep moving on then. We've already covered the Netflix story, so let's go on to Portugal. They're mm -hmm. considering a terabyte tax. Oh, man, this could put me in the poorhouse. If they put mm -hmm. a terabyte tax on you or I, we are screwed. What's going on? Uh, so, yeah, what they're proposing is a tax of between 2.5 and 5 euros. Uh, so 2.5 to 5 cents uh, per gigabyte on new purchases of electronics and storage devices. What I find is best to help with your economy and the overall state of progression of your civilization is to make sure that all of the things that power that progression are taxed and held back and held down. That always helps. Yeah. So uh, their um, rationalization for this was that, you know, individual people aren't going to buy that many terabytes of storage. Oh, okay. But businesses will pay huge tax. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Of course, drives aren't going to get larger and larger and larger indefinitely forever. And yeah. then this tax will continue to apply to those devices. And then when, when, you, or bu when you're buying iPhones with 15 terabytes in them, you're going to really hate this law. Yeah. Well, moreover, even just buying, uh, you know, a two terabyte hard drive, or yeah, two terabyte hard drive, which is about the standard size right now, uh, you know, that's adding 50 euros. It's like doubling the price of the drive. It's a shame. And it's funny, the article goes, as proposals to avoid becoming the next Greece. Portuguese is an opposition, has an opposition party opposed. So they do, have, they do have a group of people opposed to this tax on storage. Yeah. Jeez Louise. All right, Alan. Next story on the news docket is sort of an interesting one. We've talked about uh, a lot of different things on the show, but we really haven't talked about Iraq very much. And now they're actually making headlines in a technology sense. I guess Iraq has uh, begun to emerge as a bit of a uh, telecommunications hub. What's going on here, Alan? Well, uh, because of where it is, and basically, especially because of political upheaval in Iran and Syria, 
it's like it's basically the only safe path for fiber to get through from Europe to Asia. I got a picture of a guy smoking something. Uh, <clears throat> I remember that uh, right after uh, the U.S. got in there, one of the first companies that went in was uh, Verizon. Mm -hmm. So they were really early in establishing infrastructure, and they even installed CDMA. Mm -hmm. So uh, the whole world is GSM except for a few parts of Canada, a few the U.S. and Iraq. <laughs> yeah. uh, so this is interesting. That's good. That's obviously going to create a little bit of an industry over there, which is also a really good thing. Well, well yeah, uh, the Iraqi telecommunications minister was, you know, this will provide revenue for data transiting between uh, across, through the country. Uh, but basically, you know, it, what happened is uh, the uh, Iraq is now connected to the Gulf uh, fiber network. Right. And uh, basically, it provides a way, uh, a safer path for data to get from Europe through to Asia, which we kind of talked about recently with doing that over the North Pole uh, fiber link to get from London to Japan faster. But if you're trying to get to even just China or whatever from Europe, it, it makes sense to be able to... Basically, you have to go through the Gulf and the Indian Ocean and you know, Iraq's uh, a safer way to do that now. Yeah. But it also proposed some unique challenges for running the fiber because there were more than 100 oil and gas pipelines they had to go around. Right. I was just uh, looking at some of the photos of that. Yep. Yeah. Uh, some of the uh, parts of the Gulf are really shallow, so the cable has to be buried so that it doesn't get snagged by ships or anchors and so on. And uh, a bunch of other things like that. Right. Do me a favor and pop your video for me because you got froze and... Uh... Huh. So you're I'm frozen my end. You're all froze up over there. It's all right. You, Alan's, there you go. You're back. Hold all on. right. Uh, uh, my camera hasn't kicked into HD. Yeah, I know. It's fine. Should, yeah. we, uh, should we jump over to the next uh, story on the round? Yeah, we only up? got one left. Yep. Spoiler alert, your TV might or will be hacked. Mm -hmm. I, I'm freaking out, Alan. What's going on? Yeah. I'm freaking out Well, basically, out now. we're seeing more and more of these smart TVs that have browsers and internet capabilities. Dude, they run Linux. It. Some of them do. Yeah. They do. It's crazy. Fence. Uh, but, you know, that means that they're vulnerable to certain attacks. Like, sure. how many of those maybe have Samba built into them? Mm. Mm -hmm. And they were built a couple of weeks ago or whatever, or, you know, a while ago where they have this one of these vulnerable versions of Samba. Right, right. Yeah, very possible, huh? Yep. Absolutely. And they also have, they have, like, streaming media servers. The worst part is a lot of them are shipping with, like, DAP servers and uh, DLNA servers that are listening for incoming connections. Yeah. Now, <laughs> most of it won't be a big deal because your TV is going to be behind your NAT. Right. Right? So it's not really that exposed. Right. Unless somebody gets on your Wi-Fi and his hacks are in your TV. Well, or if you start doing email on your TV and open right. an attachment or something. Well, wouldn't it be or, funny like if there's like porn widgets for TVs down yep. the road that you can download that have malware on them, right? Yep. So or, you know, even just websites you go to and, and right. it exploits the browser, right? Yeah. If it runs a regular browser on Linux, right. there's a chance that it could be exploited. A couple of them even out there even run Flash. Uh, you know, and then you also, by the way, now have a built-in excuse for the significant other. If they catch you watching some sort of porn on there, you'd be like, ah, malware. Didn't, it's not, it's, I didn't do it. It's malware. Yeah. yeah. These smart TVs. Viruses so, on your TV. I guess so. Well, thank goodness. Thank goodness that TV has to be the next platform that's revolutionized by this technology wave, Alan. <laughs> I feel mm -hmm. like a codger. Uh, all right. Well, basically, uh, the article is about how the industry never considers these things ahead of time. Oh, I know. And every time, even though it's a new platform where they've done it before. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so InfoWorld has that article, and there is a link to that in the show notes. There's a link to the show notes just about everything we covered in this week's episode. I, and I think we've reached the end, yeah? Yep. There we have it. All right, Alan. Well, uh, we should let everybody know that they can catch the show live. I mentioned that at the top of the show. You can go over to jblive.tv at 1 p.m. Pacific, which is, Alan? 4 p.m. Eastern or 2000 UTC. That's, there you go. That's time math. He just did that for you right there to save you the processing cycles. Uh, and of course, you can always go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com where you also find uh, download links in the show notes for HD, mobile, tablet editions, audio only, and RSS yep. feeds where you can subscribe and get the show weekly. And uh, there we go. Well, Alan, great show. Thank you, sir. Yes. And thanks see to... Week. Yeah, see everyone in episode uh, 55. Ooh, 55. That sounds so official. Yes. It's like a... I know. Wow. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for tuning to this week's episode of TechSnap, and we'll see you right back here next week. <laughs>